God said that the church in Meduguri has failed in primarily four aspects. We are going to pray a prayer for mercy. Amen. A very serious prayer for intercession. The Bible says in Isaiah 62, verse 6, it says, I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, that they will never hold their peace day or night. In Ezekiel chapter 3, God told Ezekiel, He said, I have sent you as a watchman to watch, and if there is danger, that you warn the people. Otherwise, if you don't warn them and disaster hits them, He said, I will require the blood on your head. And I believe that as a house, God has planted us in this territory partly as watchers and as watchmen to interpret and bring to the knowledge of the people within this geographical space the counsel of the Lord part time. One of the ways to know if God is speaking through an individual or through a church or through a spiritual community is their love for the word of God. All right. So God gave me this word and I want to share it with us and we are going to stand and intercede for this land and after that we'll go into the message for the day. On Wednesday morning while I was praying early hours of that day, the Lord spoke to me and gave me a word. I was praying for something else and then God spoke to me and you know, sometimes when you are in the place of prayer, you have to understand that the primary reason for prayer is fellowship and communication between two people it's not only you that has things to tell God God has things to tell people but no one is listening that's the reason why most people's prayer life most believers experience dryness or they don't experience a steady growth in their prayer life that's because they are isolating the primary reason of prayer which is communication the reason why God created prayer is so that he can share with man. And sometimes you have to keep your needs aside and glue your ears to his heart to know what he is saying. And you know, most times when you go to pray about things before God, you will realize that God is talking to you about himself and his desires. But if you go to God about his own desires... He will bring things your way. Is that true? Or am I talking to myself? Some experienced Christians will understand what I'm talking about. You can be praying about your exam that you have just failed. And God will be telling you about his plan for another nation. And the place of intercession. And God has already he fixed it in his word. He said that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then things will come. So the secret to enjoying a consistent and unbroken life of fellowship with God is in as much as you must take advantage of the place of supplication in prayer to present your need, you must understand that your relationship with God is bigger than those needs because those needs came in time. And you are relating with a God that exists in eternity. And while I was talking to God about some things, God began to pour his heart towards me and I had to sit down and listen. And the Lord said this, and I say it respectfully speaking, I submit this revelation to be scrutinized and to be judged. The Bible says we should judge prophecy, isn't it? So you are free to scrutinize and judge it. And if you feel it is not side by side with the word of God, it is okay for you to reject it. But I cannot but speak the things that I have seen and heard. You know, that's what Peter told the Pharisees. God said that the church in Meduguri has failed in primarily four aspects. And I'm going to list them down to you. Four basic aspects that the church in this city, in this land, has failed. And it therefore means that these are areas that we need to repent and readjust. The word repent in the Greek means to turn a new leaf or to have a change of mindset. So if God is saying we should repent, it means that we need to adjust our understanding about these things. We need to seek God's own understanding. 
And you know, God doesn't have to be dramatic to communicate his counsel. He is God. He is king of kings. Is that true? So most times because there, there, we, our generation is becoming too used to drama in the name of the prophetic, we take casually heavy counsels, heavy matters that are in the heart of God communicated to his people. So please don't mind the way I speak. I want you to receive it as the word of God. By the grace of God, aside from preaching the gospel, I have served faithfully before God as an intercessor for this land since 2014. Next year makes it 10 years. So I think I can tell you a thing or two. Is that true? Well, I'll leave you. I won't say that. I won't say that. So these are the four things that the Lord said the church has failed and we need to go back to repent and readjust. Saying that we have failed doesn't mean we are not born again any longer. Saying that we have failed doesn't mean we are now completely sinners. No, no. We should be ready once and again for healthy criticisms from the Spirit of God to His church. In Revelations, we say, Let him that heart and ear hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He wrote to the seven churches and he, he acknowledged areas where they had done well. But he also pointed out areas where they have failed. Number one, God said we have failed in the area of corporate prayers and territorial intercession. Corporate prayers and territorial intercession. Intercession that is galvanized around God's purpose, God's heartbeat for a territory. I hope you know that intercession is an aspect of prayer, though it goes beyond prayer. But in the context of prayer, intercession is the aspect of prayer that has to do with the mediation between God and men. And I was preaching somewhere this morning and I told them that the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus, between the spirit and human beings. I, I, I would have thought that the person who should serve in that position of mediating between a spirit and humans should be a spirit. Abi, isn't it better that a lecturer mediates between a lecturer and students? You don't think it's better? Aha. You better believe it's better sometimes. So. At least they know how to speak their language. But the Bible says the man Jesus. And you realize that in heaven, Jesus is the only one carrying flesh. In Luke chapter 24, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he told them, he said, handle me and see. A spirit had not flesh and bones. So when Jesus resurrected and ascended to heaven, though in his true essence in the spirit, he was called the life-giving spirit. But as far as his form was concerned, he went to heaven as a man. That was why the marks of the nails were still on his hands, his feet, and the mark of the spear that, that pierced his side was still there. You know why? Because in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, It is Christ who died, in verse 34, and who was raised and is seated at the hand, right hand of God, making intercession. Making intercession. In fact, in Hebrews 7.35, he says he, he lived to make intercession for us. So that every time the devil brings up a case against you before the council of heaven, look at it, he always lives to make intercession. Every time the devil brings up a case against you, Jesus presents his body. And God sees the blood, sees the marks and everything he, he did. And remembered how he suffered on the cross. So that you can escape. That's the reason why certain things have not killed you by now. So you see that intercession goes with a note of sacrifice. And when you talk about sacrifice, it's a word that this Gen, Gen Z, that's what they call us. We don't want to have anything to do with it. It's almost been isolated from Christianity now. And that is why, that is why, if this generation like this should face the great tribulation, very few will be saved. 
Because there is an aspect of your faith where it is written in scripture, point blank, that you will have to suffer certain things as a mark of approval of your sonship. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 that he, he made the captain of our salvation perfect through his sufferings. So if what authored our salvation was suffering, it means therefore that you cannot, and I'm not saying this, this is not bad news. This is just the news. That there is an aspect of your Christian experience where you will have to suffer. And let me even put it well so that somebody can understand. Where you have to suffer in silence. Because when Jesus was in the desert, he was alone. And notice that the Bible says it was God who pushed him there. The Spirit drove him to the wilderness. God submitted him to the devil to be tested. But the Bible says that after he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. So the Lord says that we have failed in the place of corporate prayers and intercession. It doesn't mean that we don't pray together. But corporate prayers is not just coming together to pray. We can come together and pray need-driven prayers. Meanwhile, God's heartbeat for the lost is not attended to. We can come together and pray for, the, for, for, for miracles, for this and that. But no one is thinking about the salvation of souls. No one is thinking about the agenda of God's kingdom. No one sees that we are the mercy. Or God is at the mercy of our deliberate effort to advance his cause and his government. In fact, the image of Christ that creation and our society can see is the image that we have presented. So if we have presented a powerless Jesus, it's not because Jesus is powerless. It's because we have presented him that way. And God has kept himself within the jurisdiction of the church. That he cannot express or reveal himself without going through the church. In Revelation chapter 1, remember the revelation of John, the beloved. He said he turned and saw Jesus, like the Son of Man, walking in between the candlesticks. And those candlesticks, those lampstands, we are, having, we are going to do a teaching on that very soon. An epistle to the lampstands. The Bible says Jesus was walking in the midst of the candlesticks, not before them, between them. It means that Jesus has limited his revelation and his manifestation, the expression of his person, which carries the fullness of God, to what the lampstands present. So if the lampstands don't have light on them, it's not because he is not the light of the world. It is what we decide to give. You will now see why prayerless Christianity does not help the kingdom at all. Somebody said a day without prayer is a boast against God. Somebody said prayer is hiding in God. Prayerlessness is hiding from God. What did he say to Adam in Genesis chapter 3? Where are thou? And what did Adam say? I heard your voice and I was afraid and I... That was where prayerlessness started from. Are we together here? I'm speaking, I know that I have the entire society within this land is represented here. And I want us to take this solemnly as a word from God because we're going to stand up in five minutes and cry to God. God needs to show us mercy. You know, when God begins to bring warnings, at that time, everything still looks good and peaceful. So we don't take it serious. That was why Israel and Judah went into captivity. Because when God was crying through his prophet that disaster was coming if they don't repent, it looked like the prophets were lying. Because that was when they were enjoying prosperity. But you have to be careful with every season of prosperity and abundance. Because if you don't know how to manage those seasons very well, it leads you into spiritual decline and apostasy. Number two. God said we have failed in the place of evangelism. It goes down to our passion for the lost. Passion cannot be hidden. You can say I love you and never prove it. But passion is the very expression of the love of a man. How concerned are we in our everyday lives? 
in our churches every week how concerned are we about the salvation of souls to what extent have we gone to ensure that the harvest of souls are brought into the kingdom when a man buys a car and he's just him and his wife will he keep driving that car to church only the two of them when that car can carry three more other people is the man not thinking that he can get three people who are not born again in those at the seat at the back and then it means three people are saved it's always about what god can do for us it's always about deliverance about prophecy about miracle last week we had the series we, we did the teaching on witchcraft we saw the move of god here that's what we like but when it comes to the lost when it comes to preaching the gospel message to convict the sinners are we truly concerned about it why do i stand here every week what is my motive for preaching is it just to create or to hype a particular image am i using ministry as a means to show that i'm successful or is my passion to see that men are saved so if my, if it is truly my passion and desire to see that men are saved then i will realize as a preacher that ministry is not on the pulpit is in the secret how many of us spend time to pray for churches that experience numerical decline how many of us spend time to pray for communities within our city where you know that sin and iniquity seems to abound? How many of us can look at a brother in church who is already falling because of one weakness or the other and stand in prayers to see that they are restored? In those days, discipline was in the church. When you misbehave, they discipline you and take you to the back. Even though there was an extreme to that, Rather than correcting people, it was humiliating people. But it doesn't take away the place of discipline. Because the Bible says that God chastens those he loves. You see, happy are you when the Lord chastises you. Now there is no place for discipline again. We don't know how to isolate an individual who is already falling away. And do everything possible to ensure that they are reinstated again. Maybe because even we, the pastors, we have, we have dipped our hands into iniquity. God said we have failed in the place of evangelism. God said, number three, we have failed in the place of giving. <laughs> How many of you realize that in the early church, tithe was never mentioned? Raise your hand tight was never mentioned so someone who likes to argue scripture or someone who's not grounded in the faith can stand up and say tight is an old testament thing tight has nothing to do with testament it existed before testaments began the bible says that a testament is not in force until the testator died in the old testament it was the laws that god gave moses written in that book sealed with the blood that moses used if you read your bible very well he had to sprinkle blood on that and it became a covenant in the new testament it was the blood of jesus titan started before both so it's not a testament thing it's a kingdom law you know why you don't see tight in the new testament it was because they didn't tight in the new testament they gave all you go read your Bible. I promise you by the grace of God, I will never stand here and teach you what is deceptive. No. I may be young, but I, I'm coming from somewhere. They gave all. Acts chapter 2, from verse 44 down. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, 33. The Bible says none lacked because they even went ahead and sold lands and houses. But now a building project is going on in a church and somebody is saving money to buy a car when God does not have house. And I'm not coming here because I'm coming to raise anything. Nothing. I'm not raising anything at all. God said, we have failed. Not you. We, including myself. 
Do you look at what's happening in Nigeria today? Where will be the relevance of the church if the economy continues like this? You think of it, how much is transportation now? Can people afford even food to eat? Talk more of being transported to church. If the church does not arise now, in this season, we may lose our relevance for a long time. We already have lost it. You know how? Because we're championing and shouting, this person will win, this person will win, and they didn't win. So some of the politicians now feel that, well, <laughs> it's like the soothsayers and the wizards and the necromancers are more accurate than the church. So we have already lost our relevance. This is an opportunity for us to arise. Someone say, but apostle, I give. This is not an I message. God said, we. We. And you know, you don't measure giving by how much you give. You measure it by how much is left after you give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible says that they were able to give even in the midst of their poverty. The church in Macedonia. It says out of their poverty, they no get, but they gave. And they gave abundantly. How do you bring abundance out of poverty? The Bible says, Paul said, it was because they gave themselves first to God and then to us. When a man has surrendered his heart to God, he doesn't call anything he has his own. God can wake you up tomorrow and say, that mess this bends. Take it to the church. Give it to your pastor. That extra bag of rice in your store. Take it to the church. Give the welfare. Let them share it for people who are in need. You say, but God, I kept it for Christmas. The, the Bible now says, do not be anxious of what you will eat, of what you will drink, and what you will put on. It says, life, not more than raiment. Don't think that with all this crying I'm crying, some people will be convicted. Oh. We will still have a mixed multitude. Some people have kept their heart somewhere. Apostle, when you come back to the message, we will continue. But let it be recorded in heaven that I said this. We have failed in giving. The church needs to rise up, especially because of the poverty index that is within this side of Nigeria. And then finally, God said, we have failed. Above all, this is the greatest. He said, we have failed in exhibiting or exercising love for one another. Yes, I put it, love for the brethren. That even amongst us believers in church, there is no love. That's why we side talk one another. That's why we gossip one another bad things are happening to a brother instead of you to pray for that family he said to who know what thing that they do for secret oh the bible says he that covereth his sin shall not prosper brother are you not sure you need to repent but the bible also says many are the afflictions of the righteous how many many i was watching apostle john Suleiman one of his videos recently and he said when he had the assassination attempt on his life last year that he spoke with a well-known figure in the christian dome and the person said hmm, it's only god that knows what is happening oh it's only god that will reveal it oh instead of sympathizing with a man who just lost seven people and was almost murdered think of it if that man had died last year how many true prophetic voices do we have in Africa? I hope you know Africa is in trouble now with the prophetic. I hope you know. <laughs> this is not um, to add credit. I'm not doing any support. No, no, no. But when you are commending people or churches in the body of Christ, it's good to voice them out. That is one of the only genuine prophetic voices alive in Africa we don't care about one another any longer when was the last time you took your phone on whatsapp at least and just communicate a message of hope and share to your contacts it could be that somebody who was suicidal 
just needed that message to have hope restored. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, that we should not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth. In deed. They say, they usually say, I love you, no before mouth. Is that true? Even coming to church reflects our, first of all, it reflects our love for God. Believers are no longer willing to sacrifice. If rain falls on Sunday morning, no church. But the people that handed this gospel to us, they gave their life. Some of them were hung on poles and they set fire on them so that there will be street lights. Can you imagine? You call the brutal killing of Christians a sport. Some of them were fed to lions. Imagine a man with his entire family before lions. Some of them were sun asunder. Some of them were put into boiling oil. Some of them were literally tied to horses and chariots and dragged. They gave themselves for the gospel. Some stayed all their life without getting married like Apostle Paul. How did they cope with their urges? But they did that to preserve a heritage. But our generation, no sacrifice they lay. We look for the slightest opportunity to exempt ourselves. So if we don't love God, how can we love one another? Look at the choices you make. Every day as you consider your choices to God's will. The Bible says of Jesus in John chapter 4. That he was to go to Judea, but he must needs go through Samaria. He didn't want to go through Samaria. Remember what the woman told him. He said, Jews and Samaritans have no dealings. One time he passed through Samaria in the gospel according to Luke. And they refused to allow him enter. His disciples said, let's call down fire on these guys. Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of. He knew he was going to be embarrassed. They could literally even stone him. But the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria. When was the last time you had to constrain and inconvenience yourself for the will of God? Even when it makes you look stupid. Some of us in heaven, forget about the accolades we give to ourselves. But in heaven, before God, the father of spirits, the one that sees the heart of men. And the Bible says that he's going to bring the work of every man to open view. Everything will be judged. Before God, what's the track record of how many times you had to suffer the relinquishing of certain things because of the kingdom. You think in heaven will be rated according to our titles, apostle, prophets, bishops. No way. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 17. If children, then heirs, joint heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He said if we suffer with him, then and only then we will be glorified. I'm not even talking about love for God. I'm talking about love for one another. But it is measured first by love for God. Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to pray? We are going to cry. I had to lie down on my face. I can't tell you how many hours I, I did that prayer. But believe me, my life is not, is not amusing at all. It's not amazing at all. I had to cry for mercy. Finally, God has sent rain to us again. <laughs> Leave that story for another day. Are you ready to pray? Please rise on your feet. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy.